Good afternoon. I would suggest we get started. Um, I'll do this in English. Wait, let's see. I don't know, actually, all my slides are in English. I'll do this in English no matter what. Uh, I always get so confused when I talk, to sw talk Swedish to group meetings or anything. Um, I hope you had a nice weekend to get a chance to browse through at least some of the study questions and start reading. If you haven't done it yet, this is a last reminder to get started in reading not just the lecture slides, but also the book. What I'm going to do today is head back more into physics that I would suspect that most of you are a bit more familiar with than the chemistry. We're going to head, come back to the chemistry a bit, but not so much the low level chemistry about molecules, but talk more about proteins later in this week. And on Friday, I'm going to go through a bunch of different globular and uh, fibrous proteins. And then next Monday, I'm likely going to have Lucy give a talk about membrane proteins which is a bit of a shame because it's our research and I love talking about that, but I have another engagement at Stockholm University now. On Friday, we spoke a lot about amino acids at protein building blocks and went through a bunch of their chemistry. Um, the fact that they are chiral, that is super important. We spoke a little bit about the degrees of freedom we have in proteins. And the reason for doing this is that compared to the molecules you're so used to say from physics or so, a protein is so complicated that you can't try to understand it by approaching 1,500 or worse, 15,000 or 150,000 atoms at once. You need to simplify it. And the way we simplify this is that on each level, we try to focus on the key degrees of freedom, the key interactions, and then somehow simplify this into higher level building blocks. And when it came to the amino acids, we relatively early drew the conclusion that the most important degree of freedom for them are these rotations around bonds. Uh, not because they're the highest energy, and we'll come back today in a slightly different manner and argue why these are important. And in particular, I picked out these two torsions, the phi and psi torsions. And the reason I picked them is that they are soft enough that I can rotate around them in contrast to the peptide wand, which is of course Having the peptide bond is super important, but once you form the peptide bond, it tends to be rigid, so it doesn't change. The functions of proteins are de were determined by these high change characteristics. We spoke a little bit about two important results by Amfinsen and Leventhal, and that might very well be a good way of repeating things. What did Amfinsen say, and what did Leventhal say? Classical exam question. <laughs> Close, but no cigar. Very close, but there is one key word that missed before energy. That you actually, we haven't been through, but it's a free energy. Free energy. And as you will see later today, there is, might be a world of difference between those two. Um, so what did Leventhal say? Yes. Yes. So this is the problem, right? That Amfinsen has shown in a beautiful experiment that a protein doesn't need the cell. You can refold the proteins as under the right conditions. A protein, like any other stupid molecule, will refold spontaneously in a test tube. So it has to be governed entirely by the laws of physics. Uh, but on the other hand, we know just looking at these five psi torsions, which is an extremely simplified way of looking at it. But this is where you see the, be uh, the beauty of simplicity, right? If we just ignore everything else and just dare to make this order of magnitude approximations and just assuming that there can be two, three states per residue, by the time you have 100 residues, it's such an astronomically large number of states that there is no way nature can test all of these within a millisecond and find the right states. So there is something here we don't understand. Um, one thing that is going to help solve that a bit has to do with this hierarchy of structures. And we introduced the secondary structure elements, in particular the alpha helix and the beta sheet that I will come back to today. And the reason why it made sense to introduce those, right, is that there were these regions in this Ramachandran diagram describing the phi and psi torsions. And there were a few large islands that were common to see. And these very much corresponded to the alpha helix and the beta sheet. And because they are so common, and you will see that today, that once you start forming, say, an alpha helix, that tends to grow. It's very rare. Well, you will never have two residue in a helix and then one residue in a sheet and then one residue in a helix. 
so that you tend to have regions in a protein that form a larger building block. And this hierarchy of structure will partly help explain Leventhal's paradox. We also came to the conclusion that, again, in the interest of simplicity, it makes a lot of sense to describe things with classical interactions. Not because we can't handle, well, part of this is because we can't handle the quantum chemistry, but part of it is that virtually almost everything we're going to explain in biology does not need quantum chemistry. We rarely break or form bonds. Um, on the other hand, some of the things that to be able to treat quantum chemistry with computers, you need to introduce a bunch of approximations, such as atoms not moving, zero Kelvin. You can't have any solvent. Uh, and at that point, those solutions would be completely horrible from a biological point of view. So in biology, it actually, it's not that we are not doing the right thing. It's actually quantum chemistry, while it might seem more accurate, the solutions that we tend to introduce when we do physics actually turn out to be horrible from a biological point of view. And then I very briefly touched upon hydrogen bonds, but I'm going to come back and spend a lot more time on that today. So based on all these things that we went through last week, you could even formulate some sort of interaction description of a molecule here. Um, let's see if we can even get it moving a bit. We have a bunch of bonds that you can describe. If we don't have any better form for it, I'll just use an harmonic. We have a number of angles. Uh, this particular small water molecule is actually completely rigid, but you could imagine letting the angle here vary. We have these torsions or dihedrals where bonds are rotating. Forget about this term for now. Uh, it's not very important. You have electrostatics, charges interacting, and we have these Lennard Jones interactions that describe first that atoms can't overlap, which is really the Pauli exclusion principle. And at long distances, these induced dipoles will mean that all atoms interact, and at some point, even noble gases will condense. There is a name for this, uh, and this was, this was very much the brainchild of Ari Warschel and Schneider Lipson in the 1960s in Israel. So they coined the term force field for this, which are really horrible, simplified approximations. But the point is that they are, there are lots of constants here, and the constants are something we can parameterize from experiments. And that's the beauty in all this. We can cheat because I know what the density of water is. So I can take that model on the left and parameterize it to make sure that I roughly reproduce the properties of liquid water. And that suddenly means that in contrast to quantum chemistry, I can simulate water. I can simulate freezing of water. I can simulate how water is boiling. I can try to calculate how much it will cost to solve a hydrocarbon in water. I can calculate the diffusion of water. All these things that are actually super important if I actually want to look at water. What I can't describe, though, is that you, if you want to form some H0 plus ions or OH minus ions. So I can't explain the processes of the hydrogens, well, the hydrogen leaving the uh, H2O plus to form an H3O plus and OH minus. So there are limitations with everything, but in biology, this is going to, life sciences, this is usually way more efficient than quantum chemistry. So today I'm going to continue this. I'm going to talk a little bit more about hydrogen bonds and then. Uh, we are not really, actually, I'm not going to talk so much about Ramachandran plots. I'm fairly quickly going to head into energy landscapes and then the Boltzmann distribution that I know you're a bit familiar with, or you would better be. But uh, we're going to approach this from a slightly different point here. Uh, in this course, it's um, important that you get understand the Boltzmann distribution and get a gut feeling for what it actually will mean for biology. And that turns out to be a diff bit different in physics. Um, and at the end, if we have time, we're going to speak about electrostatics and charges in uh, proteins and biological material. But hydrogen bonds first. Um, this was the few slides I didn't have time to cover on Friday. Given all these interactions we have, hydrogen bonds are kind of easy, but also kind of complicated. Uh, so hydrogen bonds, on the lowest level, if you want to understand this, on the quantum level, it's pretty complicated. And that has to do with the electron clouds around the oxygen and a few other uh, atoms, in particular nitrogens, where you actually have a tetrahedral shape of these orbitals. Uh, and when these oxygen participates in bond, it will form two bonds with the hydrogens, but you're also going to, so that makes it have the protons up there. But in addition to those two bonds, you're also going to have two free pair, oh, no, two pairs of electrons here that are pointing in the other directions, like small ears or something. And because the oxygen has stolen a bit of the electrons from the hydrogens, that means that the hydrogens will have a, not just small, but actually pretty large, roughly 0 0.04, uh, no, sorry, 0.4 positive charge, while the oxygen is fairly negatively charged, in particular out of these ears. 
So if we now take two such water molecules and put them close to each other, that hydrogen which is positively charged is going to love to interact with that negatively charged electron orbital on another water. So you form this hydrogen bond that we dash, but in practice the hydrogen bonds, they're really strong. They're not as strong as a real bond, but they're far stronger than a normal electrostatic interaction. And then there are a ton of details about the angles you can form and everything. It's not just an electrostatic interaction. It should be plus minus 30 degrees from there to there to there. Let's not go into those details. Uh, but there is one thing that we need to know. How strong are they? Roughly 4 to 5 kilocalories per mole, or say 15 to 20 kilojoules per mole. That is different in life sciences, biology, biophysics versus traditional physics. There will be some numbers you have to learn by heart. And the reason why you need to learn them by heart is that physics kind of involves all scales of length, time, and energy, right? But in life sciences, there are some characteristic scales. These interactions are going to be important. And that means that if, an en if another energy is significantly larger than this, it might help to break a hydrogen bond. But if it's significantly lower, it won't. So say a few kilocalories per mole, four to five. These, as we're going to see later, are super important in forming alpha helices. You have tons of hydrogen bonds formed here in the helix. And that explains why this is a fairly s stable secondary structure element, right? That once you form them, you don't want to disrupt them because you would lose a lot of energy. And similarly in beta sheets, there are a ton of hydrogen bonds between the different sheets here. And there too, that's why it's a stable secondary structure element. And on an even higher level, it also explains this entire DNA spiral, uh, the double helix. All the bases between them, they're kept together by hydrogen bonds, which means that once you go through this entire replication or translation, we're going to need some proteins with enough energy to actually break this apart, which is not entirely trivial. That's both good and bad. So would it be, what would happen if you had a very low interaction energy here, if it was easy to tear DNA apart? Would it be good? Surely not. Why? Because if the interaction energy is low, it would be easy to break them apart and you would be more structured. So first, DNA would not be as stable, right? And it would likely, you would have more reading, you would have more errors in DNA and everything, and it would hurt your genetic material. Uh, so, but on the other hand, then why don't we make it real bonds? Why don't we make it 10 times higher, 50 kilocalories per mole? Surely that would be even better, right? That would even less DNA damage. Exactly, right? Because suddenly you would need a diet that would be 10,000 kilocalories per day. Because the energy for your cells to work, we need to replicate the DNA. So your cells also need to tear it apart. And for some reason, virtually all processes in life has optimized this. Again, 4.3 billion years of trial and error. Nature tends to optimize processes so that they cost as much energy as required, but not more. So that this tends to be optimized to optimize, well, accepting some errors in DNA, because we have other mechanisms that can control and fix errors, but not so much errors that we end up throwing too many proteins away because there were too many errors. And exactly why, how it has been optimized, we don't know. Actually, we know a bit, but that's a separate story. And you might already now start to guess that this is going to have something to do with protein folding too. That whenever a protein chain stretched out, there will be some residues that, well, depending on whether they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic, uh, they will form hydrogen bonds either with water or they will have to organize around the hydrophobic groups. And then when we fold the proteins, some things will happen here. We're going we're gonna to disrupt some hydrogen bonds. We might form some new hydrogen bonds and we might simply have a better split between hydrophobic and hydrophilic groups. But we'll come back to that in a few minutes. But this so-called hydrophobic effect is going to be one important interaction. So if we just hand wave here a bit, there are a few interactions. We might have bond lengths. We might, there will also be some angles that could be important. We have some Lennard jones interactions and also charges that I haven't written here. You have some torsion angles. And then in some sort of hand waving fashion that we're not quite sure about yet, there is some sort of hydrophobic effect. Oil, oily stuff, hydrocarbons, they should not be in water. They want to turn away from water. But exactly why, you don't know yet. And in general, if we now take this molecule, and this is a, still a tiny molecule, just an amino acid, and if we place this in lots of different conformations, 
Well, depending on what conformation it has, it's going to have an energy that's better or worse. Remember that force field plot I showed you that you can, given the position of all atoms, you can calculate that energy. Well, in practice, you're going to let a computer do it. But for every conformation, there is an energy we can put on the molecule, whether you can calculate it or not. And at least, and in practice, again, this is, what is it, 20 atoms? That would mean a 60-dimensional function. Pretty complicated. We're not even going to try to visualize that, but it's important. It's very useful as some sort of mind tool to think of a multidimensional uh, thing. And because we're humans, it's hard to think of more than three dimensions. Um, and that usually means that we draw, th draw things as a function of two variables. So you have the function value on the z-axis that is, again, a function of some sort of arbitrary x and y variables here. I don't care what those variables are. In principle, there should be 60 axes here, but that's too much. But in general, depending on how they move with molecules, there will be some things that are higher energy and there will be some things that are lower energy. And to move between these, you will have to cross barriers. And the obvious question then is, what is good versus bad here? And since you're a physicist, I can, you will probably agree with right away that having low energy is good, having high energy is bad. The question is, how bad is that and how good is that? Is that good enough and is that too bad? Will it, if we are here, Will it be too costly to cross that barrier to go down there? And the short answer to that is, of course, it depends. But we want to be slightly more quantitative than it depends. Uh, and that's where it comes in that there are natural energy scales in biophysics. It's not just energy energy, right? So what was that characteristic energy that we were thinking of? As one example. There are, sorry? Yes, but how many? Well, 425. Uh, and in, actually, you are you're partly right, because in a large protein, you could imagine maybe having 10 hydrogen bonds or so. That actually sounds a little bit. It's not a whole lot more than that. But you're talking about single to possible double-digit double digit kcals. We're never talking about megajoules, and we're never talking about millijoules. And that means that there is a natural z-axis here, right? There will be... I biked here today. Uh, and given that how icy it is outside, when you're biking, suddenly you're, the entire bike is shaking because there are small pieces of ice on the road. On the, I don't really care, right? Because the bike will just go over it. I don't care about it. And then, well, there might be a barrier of 10 centimeters of ice. I can still get over that, but I have to go a bit slower. On the other hand, the big two meter barrier of snow, I'm not even gonna try to go over it. And that's different than in physics, that there are characteristic scales. I don't care about the one centimeter, the one millimeter I won't even feel. 10 centimeters starts to matter, and one meter is impossible. Which is, again, compared to all the possible lengths of scales in the universe, there's a very narrow range there that determines whether something is possible or not. And being that you are a physicist, you probably all know what's going to determine the distributions between these, and that's the Boltzmann distribution. Have all of you uh, worked with the Boltzmann distribution? Have all of you taken a StepNet course? Statistical mechanics? One brave soul. Okay, but that's great. Uh, because then actually there might be a point in me driving this. Um, are you familiar with the Boltzmann distribution? This is a seemingly very simple equation, but I would argue it's one of the deepest in physics. Uh, why is this deep? Well, the reason why this is deep, there is a famous saying that, uh, and I'm not sure whether how much of a rumor it is, that when Albert Einstein was one asked, is there one branch of physics that's never ever going to be overturned? And then his point was, right, that's been my statistical mechanics, um, or even uh, thermodynamics. And the point is that this is not based on observation. Things like quarks or anything, that's a model based on the observations we have this far, right? But what makes many of these things complicated, they're not really based on observations. They're based on general reasoning about arbitrary systems. We don't necessarily have to make assumptions. And because we don't make assumptions, there are no assumptions here that are based on present observations. And of course, because it's not based on observations, it's not really going to be overturned by new observations. But that also what makes it complicated. Um, and I, there is a famous, there's a famous uh, quote in, the, uh, in a book by statistical mechanics written by David Good, Goodstein, uh, and talk about how Boltzmann died for his own hand, and then Ehrenfest, one of his students, also committed suicide. And I think the student of Ehrenfest also committed suicide, and say, now it's our turn to oppose statistical mechanics. Perhaps it's wise to do it with a bit of caution. Uh, and StatMec has this reputation for being super, super difficult, and it's, sure, if you're going to be a professor of statistical mechanics, it is difficult. 
but just understanding and getting this gut feeling isn't really that difficult. But you have to let it take time. So what this ultimately determines is that as a function of an energy in some sort of arbitrary state, you can think of putting this molecule in a particular conformation, but this is really any molecule, system, anything. Depending on what, what the energy is, how likely is it to observe the molecule in that state, which we call density or rho. And that describes, for instance, of a gas. Uh, you might have heard, uh, you pro might have heard of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. At low temperature, the average velocity of gas molecules is fairly low, but you have a distribution of them. And as the temperature goes up, the average velocity of the gas molecules becomes higher and higher and higher. It's essentially proportional to the mass times velocity. The average velocity squared multiplied by the mass divided by two. And that goes for most things. So if you're boiling water, of course, the, uh, the, you're adding energy, the water becomes hotter, and at some point it's going to become so hot that it becomes water vapor instead of liquid water. It's possible to derive this for a completely general system, and we're going to do that tomorrow. If I were to do that now, half, at least in the times when I had this class and half of the class are biologists, they would die if I started with that. So we're going to do what the book on um, protein physics actually does and start by deriving this for a special system. Uh, simply because to make this a little bit more accessible to you. Uh, it's going to turn out at the end of the day, all the properties of this special system will disappear. And the special system that the book chose and that I will follow is that think of it as a sort of pillar full of gas. Uh, and we all, you can probably all say that uh, the pillar could even be the Earth's ecosystem. The density of gas is higher the further down you are, say in the atmosphere, while very far up in the atmosphere you're going to have lower density. And the reason for that is that, well, if all the gas, the higher up you are, the higher the potential energy is, right? So all other things equal, you would like to be lower down. And you can test that. Yes, it's still true. Uh, if you just drop anything, it wants low potential energy. But on the other hand, we can't have all the gas molecules down here because if all the gas molecules were down here, well, the energy here would be close to, uh, this, sorry, the density here would be close to infinite and that would be horribly bad. So some of the gas molecules will have to be further up, but it makes sense to have more of them down here and then some sort of gradient going up. And since we're anyway simplifying, there's no point, well, unless you love uh, spherical polar coordinates and everything, there's no point in doing this for the Earth, right? Let's just assume that we have some sort of very narrow vessel that just goes up, and there is some sort of variable here that determines the height. And as a function of height, we have some sort of number of gas molecules or density of gas molecules, and that's what we would like to determine. So as a function of the height, how many gas molecules do we have or density? And the two opposing forces, as I drawn there already, is that we have, oh sorry, that's a bit, bad. we have gravity pushing down, all the water molecules, sorry, all the air gas molecules would like to go down. On the other hand, we have the pressure acting in the other direction. And these are equations that you've gone through in undergraduate physics, and that's the reason why it's much easier to do this simple system. So then we're going to have a couple of equations here. Uh, they're not so, I'll, I'm going to take, the reason why I don't draw this on the, I might draw something on the blackboard, but it's, it's not particularly difficult, and I think I've added all the intermediate steps here. We have the gas law, and all the chemists know this by heart, it's PV equals nRT, but you're a physicist, so let's replace that R with a K. PV equals nKT. What is the difference between these two? Yes. Uh, so chemists are used to working in the lab. And in practice, in the, this is the same thing with natural scales. Right? You're a physicist. To you, it's obvious you count the molecules. But a chemist would never dream of adding 6 times 10 to the, six times 10 to the 20 molecules. They want to add 0 0.05 moles of the molecule. It makes much more sense when you're sitting in the lab. So for the chemist, it's easier. I even said that those hydrogen bonds, do you remember what they are? 4.5 kilojoules per mole. 4.5 kilojoules for one bond, that would be an insanely high energy. But rather than saying, oh, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 20th joule, that's difficult to work with. So chemist, everything in chemistry we like to calculate per mole, and you're going to do it too. Pick any here, but I'm not going to do it for both. So let's just stick to KT, and that makes sense where we're going to see the results. So in principle, the Clapeyros law that I hope you know, the gas law, PV equals NKT, 
uh, we have the pressure and we have a volume. We have a total number of uh, molecules, at least in the small field we're looking at, the small yellow band on the previous slide, and then Boltzmann's constant K and the temperature T. And in principle, I could introduce an arb I could introduce, say, what the volume is. I could say what the area of the vessel is. And if we love to do bookkeeping, that's not going to hurt us. But it also makes sense, you know what, let's see if we can factor out some things so there are fewer things we have to care about. And one of the things you can do on the left-hand side there, if we divide both sides by the volume, I get that, well, just P on the left-hand side, and then the number of atoms per volume multiplied by KT. That is much nicer, because let's just say that, let's calculate per volume, and then I don't have to care about the area of the vessel or anything. So that, then we introduce the lowercase n, and the lowercase n is just the number of water molecules per volume. So then we simplify Clapeyron's law a bit to say P equals NKT. Again, not really, that is not a lack of generalization. So then we know how the pressure varies with the number of particles. And remember, the number of particles is a function of the height, H, and the pressure is also a function of the height. So in principle, those should be functions, but I'm lazy when I wrote these equations. And then if I want to see how things are changing as a function of the height, it makes sense to see what the derivatives there are. Well, if it's only P and N that varies, the derivative of P with respect to the height, that's going to be the derivative of N with respect to the height, and K and T are just constants. So they just remain constants. Do you follow me that far? I haven't really done a whole lot there. So this describes how the pressure component is acting, the upwards pressure. The other part is the downwards pressure that comes from gravity. And I'm going to hand wave just a little bit here that in that small yellow band we had, we have a certain mass. And that mass is a certain energy. What is pressure? Well, pressure is force per area. Uh, but per area we can forget about because we calculated everything per area per volume. So that area part disappears but I'm going to need to calculate how the energy changes because force is the derivative of energy, right? So that the total energy of in that small, the potential energy in that small band is going to be the mass of the molecules multiplied by the gravitational constant multiplied by the height at where we are. And if we want to, uh, that's for each molecule. And if I now want to look at how many such molecules do I have in that yellow band, well, that would be the D8, the width of that yellow band, right? So the mass multiplied by the gravitational constant multiplied by the small D8, that's how we're changing. And then the number of molecules per volume. That's the total change per volume when we go up. But then I wanted to calculate how much this is changing, because sorry, that was the energy, that's the change in energy. Uh, so the derivative would then be how that is changing relative to dn, right? I'll come back to that in a second. So again, pushing up on the previous slide, we had the change in pressure as we go upwards. The pdh equals the derivative of the number of particles with respect to the height multiplied by kt. That was acting up. In the other direction, now we have to be careful. We already had this MGN term pushing down, but that is pushing down. And here I am, if I'm going to put this equal, I will have to swap the sign here, right? Because that's the one of, they're acting in different directions. So that if I'm moving up, the number of, uh, Yes, if I'm moving up here, it's easier to think of it this way. If MGN is positive, mass is positive, G is positive, and the number of particles is always positive. If that is positive, that minus sign would make the right-hand side negative when I go up. And we also know with our gut feeling, right, that as we go up, we expect the number of particles to decrease, so this derivative should be negative too. It's not entirely easy to follow otherwise, but the difference is that if we're looking at the gravitational part, we're thinking of how this this pushing down 
And if I want to put that equal to the force pushing up, they are equal, but they're equal in magnitude. They're not equal in directions. To actually put them equal, I will have to swap the sign of one of them to say that they're equal. And again, in this case, by far the easiest thing is to try to reason and realize that do I have the right sign? If I go up a bit, how should that term change in sign? And how should that term be in sign? This is not as difficult as you see. So that we now have the derivative of the number of particles with respect to the height multiplied by this constant equals minus mgn. And then I just move things around a bit here. Uh, the kt I can divide on both sides. So I have the derivative of n equals some sort of constant multiplied by n itself. And remember, n was a function. n is a function of h. Do you follow me that far? And you are physicists. You should probably be able to guess what form n of h has. So if I have a function, and then I take the derivative, and I get the same function, but a constant in front of it. It should be exponential. Yes, it should be exponential. Uh, and you are, it would be perfect. Actually, I, what I would have said, I would recognize that, okay, it must be an exponential, and that must be the constant up in the exponential. If you don't know that, uh, another way, and again, this is one of the things that, in, if you're a mathematician, this might be obvious. But the way to derive this, if you're not a physicist and you haven't worked all your life with exponentials, is to remember that the law that if you derive a logarithm, you get, if you derive a logarithm of a function, you get one divided by the function multiplied by <coughs> the derivative of the function. And that means that we can take this, the derivative of the log, that's exactly what I had on the last slide, right? Oops. If I take n here and divide n by both sides, I have one divided by n multiplied by the derivative is equal to a constant. So that would correspond to that, and that's what I had here, right? So that's the derivative of the logarithm of n is equal to that constant. Then I integrate that. So the logarithm of n is that constant multiplied by n. And then I take the exponential of both sides. So that we said that n is proportional to an exponential function and then minus mgh divided by kt. Why is it just proportional and not equal to an exponential function? So what happens here in this step, right? When we integrate the left-hand side there and the right-hand side, I should add a constant in the integration. But then when I take the exponential, that constant there, if you remember your exponential laws, that will mean that the constant will show up in front of the exponential there. So there will be an arbitrary constant. I have to confess that I am incredibly sloppy with this. And in concert with mathematicians in life, say, yeah, whatever. It's just equal and proportional to is roughly the same thing. Uh, you might even see me saying so that n equals an exponential, and then we implicitly think, well, yeah, but you're going to normalize it at some point. And I could cheat and say that, well, technically, I didn't say what the, what the units of n is, so I can have that constant in my units. But right now, we have no idea how we're going to normalize it. So let's forget about that constant for now. So what they just say that, in this case, we're saying that the number of particles at the height in this vessel is proportional to the exponential function. And then we look at this, and it just uh, mgh just turns out to be equal to the energy, right? Uh, sorry, this should not even be, if I have said delta energy here, this should be the energy relative to the zero point. So the number of particles with the density is somehow proportional to the exponential of minus an energy divided by kt. But completely arbitrary, oh, sorry, completely arbitrary special case. I haven't proven this in general, but this is uniquely valid and it has nothing to do with the system as you're going to see tomorrow. That you might have seen before, uh, but the important part for our course is to think about what this means. So if we look at two states, and again, think of a molecule if you want to, but this could be any state a system could be in. So the probability of being in an arbitrary state A probability or density to be with energy A. That's a constant multiplied by the exponential to minus the energy in the state A divided by KT. And it's exactly the same thing for the B state. The probability of being in the B state is the same constant, the same exponential and everything, but now it's the energy B there. This is what you're going to be playing around with in your first hand-in task. 
And even though you've known the Boltzmann distribution, the point of this hand in task is to give you a gut feeling for this, what this will really mean in a real system. And how large, again, depending on what the energy scales are, what do we mean by low versus high probability? And in particular, that this constant is fairly irritating. I have no idea what this constant is. But here's where physics, or at least math, comes to the rescue. It's very rare that I just want to know what is the probability of being in an arbitrary state. In most cases, it's enough. How likely is state A compared to state B? I always want to look at differences. And the second, if I want to look at differences, I can take the quota of these two, right? And the beautiful thing there, and I can just strike out the Cs. They disappear. And that might initially look like a horrible, complicated uh, quota of exponentials. But again, if you know your exponential laws, that means that you can take the difference. Sorry, this can be expressed as one exponential. And then you just put the difference between those two energies and the exponent there instead. So that the probability, the relative probability of these two states is an exponential minus the difference in energy divided by kT. That in particular it means it doesn't matter where our zero point was. Whether the zero point of this height in this cylinder was at sea level or starting from this floor or from the basement, it doesn't matter. Because I'm just looking at the relative difference. That is going to rescue us all the time in proteins. I don't care what the zero level is. I'm just looking at relative things. The other thing we generally say that the lower the energy is in a state, the more populated it will be. And again, if you know your mathematics, uh, and this might sound stupid, but you have no idea how fast the exponential function grows. Do you know that the exponential raised to the power of 50, is that a large number? How large? More than the number of atoms in the universe. So that the exponential, like, I think the exponential to the power of 20 is the number of possible moves in Go. So that. <laughs> It's insane, completely insane. And that also means that the second an energy starts going up, and you might think that it's, it just doubled, it just went up a tiny bit, you will very quickly get to the point where you have almost no density whatsoever there. So almost everything will be in the lowest level state. In theory, you might have a little bit a higher level up, but there is a very strong driving force to go to the lowest level state. And that comes back to Amphison's observation, right? And that's why, well, this far we have it just said energy, um, which means that the next slide is a beautiful illustration. There is one complication here that I was lying to you. Assuming, and I realize in hindsight, this is a really bad slide because these four shapes should have had the same volume. Um, sorry about that. If we assume that they have the same volume, <laughs> the first approximation. Um, and if we did the math here, which one, remember what I said, it's good, it's good to be low level, right? Uh, actually, you can compare those two. So if we focus on those two. Which one is worst and which one is best? If you had to put gas in them, which one? The same amount of gas in those two triangles, which one would have the lowest energy? The one to the right. Why? Because I'm thinking more molecules will assemble at the bottom, and thus they will mm -hmm. be further down. And the Does everyone agree? And the interest time. I'm going to have a peer challenge later on. So in this case, you're quite right. But so exactly where in the equation did that enter? Well, I was thinking maybe when you derived the equation and you were looking at um, the, uh, the potential energy. So that the problem here is that I only looked at energy, right? Mm -hmm. And the en potential energy here. How is the potential energy there different from the potential energy there? It's the same. So the problem is not captured in our equation. So there is something we're missing. And the part we are missing is that I kind of assumed that it was equal, right? So that the number of atoms we could have, we can have more here. I think we all agree. How do we measure more? We can think in terms of volume. And if we have, and here it's not ideal either, because I would, this is infinitesimally small. But assuming that this was 10 times wider here, we would intrinsically think we can have 10 times more here than there, right? So somehow we need to weigh this by the amount of volume. And that's fairly easy. So let's just say that state A has a particular volume, VA, and state B has a particular volume, VB. 
That's another thing that I know you might have done this in physics before, but for the biology students, I keep going through this. Don't be afraid of assuming. I, sadly, I think it's, it goes back to this way. I think the way we teach math and physics is completely stupid because we, we only ask you to solve problems that we know the answer and we're going to instruct you so that you know when you start solving the problem that you have the right answer, right? That's how you do it at exams. You know that if it's a differential equation, either you know exactly how to solve it or you have no idea. Uh, the scary part is that research is like the second one. When I, again, if I know how to solve a problem, it's not research. When I need to solve a problem, I start with paper and pen, and, and I sit and write, and sometimes it works. And if I work the week, well, if I worked an afternoon on this problem and I don't get anywhere, then I probably try to take a step back. Let's look in the literature. Is there a smarter way to approach this? And it's the same thing here. Don't, don't be afraid of making assumptions. The app, what is the absolute worst thing that can happen is that we don't get further. And then we're going to need to deal with that problem then. So if there's something I don't know what it is, just introduce it as a constant. And we'll either we'll be able to factor it out later or we'll deal it with it when that happens. So the, the number of states, if I have two states where I have a certain energy, there are two places where I can put balls or molecules or something. So I think you all agree that making this proportional to the volume makes sense, right? So that the proportional of being in volume A or state A and the proportional to be in volume B, well, I should multiply these probabilities with the volumes. I take exactly the same terms I had in the last slide, but I now put the volumes in front of them. So if volume A is now much, much, much larger, even though the energies are the same, if volume A is much larger, it's better to be an A, more likely to be an A. 10 times larger, it's 10 times larger. The only problem is that there are now a one, two, three, four constants here. Yeah, that's fun, not. But let's, let's, yeah, sorry. Uh, is V a function of H or is it just? Uh, no, so that, uh, that's a good question. So that the energy is a function of H, okay. uh, but at this function, rather than assuming that the area or the volume was same everywhere, right? We now allow the volume, and I know here I'm not necessarily talking about the H just, but for any state you can be in, there is an energy in the state, and that we determine by the energy, but there is also somehow a size of this state. So if I look at the previous slide, the energy there is the same as the energy there, but you have more volume here. So if you have the same energy, but in one, if I have the same energy here, but I have one state there, and I have the same energy here, but there are three states here, we're gonna see three times more particles there than there, right? But I, this, I'm not sure about you, but having these volumes and everything complicates things. Um, so we can use a very simple trick. And here too, the proof is in the eating of the pudding. You're allowed to introduce absolutely anything that's mathematically valid, and then we'll see how far we get. So I can just say that the volume, well, I could write that the exponential of the logarithm of the volume. That's just a stupid expansion. But if I now do that, that would mean that the logarithm of the volume, well, then I have two exponentials, right? An exponential multiplied by another exponential. So the logarithm of the volume would then appear inside the exponential. So I could write this complicated expression here, say that the logarithm of the volume A there plus the logarithm of the volume B there, and then I can even multiply them by KT. And this, again, this might look completely horrible, but the point is that if you go back two slides, this looks exactly like the Boltzmann distribution. But instead of the energy, it says our energy minus KT logarithm of volume. So it looks exactly like the Boltzmann distribution, but it doesn't just have the energy. It has a small volume component there too. So it says E minus TK L and V. Does that look beautiful and simple to you? Uh, in principle, we're going to have a break, but I can take two more minutes to finish this thought. Um, how do we simplify that? Because there's many things, but not beautiful. <laughs> can you simplify it? At some point, no, we don't know, really know what the volume is, right? 
So I can't say anything about the water. Because again, it, now forget about that gas system. We're going to argue things that are universally valid and there are no universal truths about volume. Well, they have to be positive, which is good. So I can take the logarithm of it. But that's all I can say. So what do you do with a physicist if you can't simplify things further? We define. So I'm not sure about you, but I don't like... Well, so this is where we introduce something. Let's just take the horrible K, L, and V things and introduce something. Let's call it S. Have, if you, whether you've touched upon entropy or not before, it doesn't matter. Entropy is not something you can deeply understand or have a gut feeling for. This is just a constant in our equations, and then we introduce a name for it. So this somehow describes the property whether there are many ways of putting molecules. It, it's, of course, it's kind of related to volume. But if you don't like to think in terms of cubic centimeters or something, this is something, it's just a letter that somehow describes the system. It describes that there is lots of freedom in the large bowl, but very little freedom in the pointy bowl. And I don't introduce temperature. <laughs> Why don't I introduce temperature? Because the temperature might change, right? And if the temperature changes, the shapes of those vessels don't change. So it's nice, I don't want something that this should only depend on the vessel or the system, while the temperature depends on, well, the temperature. So that horrible expression that I had on the last slide now, <coughs> in each of these, it says, it says E minus T, and then K, L, and V just says S. So it says E minus T, S there, and E minus T, S there. So that's... Or seemingly horrible expression, just when I had the Boltzmann distribution, when I did not care about the volume, I just said that the difference of something was proportional to the exponential minus delta E, the difference in energy divided by KT. And if I just introduce this top concept instead, E minus TS, I get exactly the same thing. It looks exactly like a Boltzmann distribution, but this now also accounts for this, like, that different states might have different volumes or different things some sort of internal property of the state. I'm going to come back to that after the break. We're so not done with entropy. Uh, but the point with entropy is that trust your maths and physics here. Don't try to have a gut feeling for this. This is easy, right? This is something we have chosen to define. We're going to see after the break that it makes sense. But that's just a bonus point. Uh, I stole two minutes here. So let's meet here 17 minutes past. And we'll continue. All right. Let's jump back into the deep side of the energy and entropy pond. Um, I know that some of you told me during the break that you take it courses on statistical physics and everything. We're going to come back to that more both today and tomorrow. But the point is right now that there are two concepts. There are energy, and I think that all of you have a gut feeling what, what energy is. That when energy is high, there is lots of things and atoms are moving fast. And what we somehow need to check now is whether can we have some sort of gut feeling for this entropy thing. The main reason for introducing entropy is really that it makes our life simpler. Rather than having to worry about volumes and everything, there is something here that we can say that it's a property of the system, or at least a property of the state the system is in right now. And if we introduce this, this makes our equations very simple. And when our equations are simple, we're happy because we can handle them. And that means that instead of just saying comparing the energies of two systems, I can, again, I this F, the free energy. I can compare the free energy between two systems. And it's a simple world that we can just have the Boltzmann distribution, and we're happy. This, my friends, is something that you need to know. I should be able to wake you up at 3 a.m. in the morning, and you should say F equals E minus TS. If you don't know that by the exam, I will literally kill you. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure where to go back, but pretty much the rest of the course is going to be about this equation. This is way deeper than you think. If you think that the exponential error, this is a fairly easy equation and simple. This is a deep, profound equation that can actually be quite difficult to understand the implications of. So I'm going to use a small, I used to use a picture of my kids' rooms here, but uh, <coughs> I think they, they're going to have to. So this is a completely anonymous professor's desktop. Uh, <clears throat> you can probably guess which is mine at work, at least. Um, rather than think about gas molecules, this too is a system. And uh, you can think about states here. So how many states do these things correspond to? It's a bit of a difficult question. 
So we can cheat a bit here. And I think uh, the point here is that this is just really, what do we mean by state? So one simple way of saying state, well, a particular distribution of pixels on my screen, that's a state. If I have exactly the same color of every single pixel on my screen, it's obviously the same state. But if one pixel has changed color, it's a different state. That would be the lowest minimal. But on the other end, if I take, if I take one of the icons up there and move it one pixel to the left, you wouldn't even notice. You would likely still it's the same order desktop, right? So that there are kind of two ways we can define state. One on the lowest possible level if a single atom has moved, and then maybe on a slightly similar level, that how many similar states are there? And occasionally we're going to call the top one micro states with I, and this one macro states with an A. The point here is that there is just one state up there. The second point that might be less obvious is that there is just one state down there too, because that there is one particular distribution of pixels on my screen or one particular distribution and position and velocity of atoms in a molecule, a microstate. It doesn't teach us anything. And that goes down if we're only looking at energy, a state is a state is a state. It doesn't matter whether there are other states that look like it or not. But the point is that there are relatively few ordered states that look roughly like that one, but that there are a ton of states that looks roughly like that one. So somewhere, if we, if we forget about the individual pixels, if you want to talk about this crazy professor's how ordered his desktop is, this macroscopic, the large scale states, well, that is one state. While we want to, want to say, we might want to group all the states with our icons all over the desktop as one sort of macroscopic way of describing disorder. And this is where this gut feeling of entropy as disorder comes in. There's lots of volume here. There are lots of different ways we can distribute things. There are lots of ways of organizing things that correspond to this LN volume being high. And that is a high entropy or disorder if you want to think about it and there's a gut feeling. While if there is only one way of organizing things, well, by definition, that would correspond to this narrow piece of the uh, vessel where there was only one way of having states. Very low number of different states, low volume, low microstates, whatever you would call it, low entropy order. But the point is that don't try to think too much about that. Entropy is something we define. What is entropy? K times L of G. Yeah. The logarithm of the number of microstates. And you are physicists, so the micro you can choose. Do you stay at the classical limit and you want to define things by the positions and velocities of your atoms, or would you like to go quantum? You're more than welcome to go quantum, but not in my course. Um, there, it is possible to define the number of microstates. And properly defined, the entropy is the logarithm of that multiplied with some sort of constant. And the point with that is that then we might choose to interpret this as disorder, but it's much easier to start from the plain definition. And that actually turns out that it helps us to understand some other things too. Why is it difficult to solvate oil in water? This is this hydrophobic effect we spoke about. I don't expect you that this would be an obvious answer right now, but in that case, I would argue that the reason why it's difficult to solve oil and water is that the energy is going to be the same. You don't lose energy, but something happens with the entropy here. It's very unfavorable for the second term, that the entropy, it's, this is a much more ordered state. But let's go through that and derive it with the help of that equation. What is the likelihood that this will happen spontaneously? I keep using my computer, but for some reason, I never go spontaneously from there to there. Because there are way many more states. Even if the likelihood of going from one state to another is always the same, because there are so many more states like that. So if you just randomly end up in a state, it's likely going to be one of those, not that one. And this corresponds to one of the laws of thermodynamics, actually, that the entropy of an isolated system will either go up or be the same. Let's see. Yes, I think I have a couple of slides about that. Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe not. Uh, let's define it this way. I have slides about this later, but then I can skip them later. So 
So what's going to happen in water, there will be some slides on this. Um, by default, all the waters, they live happily and have lots of hydrogen bonds formed with each other. So you have a network full of hydrogen bonds and there are lots of good interactions here. And waters are also fairly free to diffuse. You might have seen that in the video I showed you last week, right? And now I put a big blob of oil in this water. Does oil participate in hydrogen bonds? No. No. So what will happen here? Let's do this. I have my drop of oil, and then I have lots of water here. You just broke all the hydrogen bonds. How much energy was each hydrogen bond? Yeah, well, four to five or so. That can be, I think, between two and six, I would say. That's a lot of energy. Like, multiply by five or ten, that's a shitload of energy. That's astronomically bad. That's eat my left shoe bad. That's not going to happen. There is no way you could lose that many hydrogen bonds in the system. That system could not even exist in that shape. That energy is so much that the poor waters, they will do virtually anything in their power to maintain their hydrogen bonds because it's so much energy in them. So what these waters will do, they're not going to stand for this. They will, because they're also free to move, right? So the, what the waters will do, and I'm bad at drawing here, but they will reorganize around this molecule into kind of a network so that you can still have hydrogen bonds, and sorry, this is not perfectly drawn here. So do, they will do anything they can to form a mesh around the oil so they can maintain their hydrogen bonds. And they will maintain their hydrogen bonds. We can even measure that. So the net change in hydrogen bonds of this process is plus minus zero because it would be so dramatically bad to lose them. And then we're in a bit of a strange situation because it, we didn't lose any energy. The energy in this oil thing is exactly the same thing it was when we started. But what has happened? So remember the movie I saw when I said that the waters were fair, quite free to diffuse, right? They could write that. So what does that correspond to in terms of volume or the number of states they can be in? They have a lot of volume available, lots of states available. What has happened here? Yes, so that we don't know how much more, but it's radically lower. They're radically less free. So the volume is going to be much lower, and then the logarithm of the volume is also much lower. So the entropy is much lower here. If you just looked at the original Boltzmann distribution, that would not help us one yota, because the volume or free energy doesn't matter. But if we take our small equation here, that the free energy equals, give it some space between the letters here, because I'm going to add something in front of them. The free energy equals E minus T as well. That might not tell you a whole lot. Usually it's difficult to think in absolute terms. It's much better to think of changes. So I think the delta in free energy is the delta in energy minus temperature multiplied by the delta, the change in entropy. So in this process, the change in energy was roughly plus minus zero. But the change in entropy, well, the entropy decreased. And then you have minus there and a the minus sign in front. So that means that the free energy went up, and we don't go uphill. So this is a bad process that would, the free energy would go up, not the spontaneous process. So we could not describe that process just by looking at the energy. But when we include the entropy or think of this in terms of free energy, we can start to explain things like that. We'll come back to that. And that is very much related to this entropy of an isolated system, not in equilibrium, but just keep increasing over time and approach a maximum when it reaches equilibrium. The problem when we define things, defining things is good. The only problem with defining things is that different people have a tendency to define things in different ways. Um, and when they define things in different ways, scientists can't even agree on letters. It's amazing that there are these the difficult things like introducing the SI system that we can agree on, but what letter we're going to use for what property we can't agree on. So when you are a physicist, we frequently talk about the free energy just the way I wrote. 
energy minus the entropy part, and then we use F. If you're going to do this in a proper way, this is called the Helmholtz free energy. And the Helmholtz free energy means that you have some sort of system enclosed in yellow here where we're only exchanging heat with the environment. You can't change the atoms, can't go in and out, and most importantly, you can't do work. You can't change the volume. The reason for that is that if you are actually changing the volume, if you can change the size of the system, we should also account for this work multiplied by pressure times volume. Because even if I have the same temperature, I might exert work on the environment, mechanical work, and that is something I have to take into account. In general, this is super important in physics. This is called the Gibbs free energy, and it's probably really the proper free energy. It includes more. In chemistry, this is the one we should always, almost always use. Why? Well, the problem is that chemical systems are usually open to the rest of the world. If you have things in a test tube, the volume here can change a bit, right? And then you're doing work against the air pressure. That's too complicated. In particular, room temperature, the normal chemical reactions we have, we're going to have 0, 0.0, we're going to have millimolar or something with proteins. So in principle, we should use G, we should call delta G. In practice, I'm just going to use that one because the pressure times volume doesn't matter in biophysics. But if you're a proper physicist, if you're doing, say, designing nuclear weapons or something where the pressure is high, then you need Gibbs free end. I'm not going to, I'm going to continue the physics a bit because this leads to a bunch of really fun stuff. Uh, so in the previous slide, did you think that entropy was a complicated feature? So there was only one thing that's more complicated than entropy in those equations. And the funny thing, that is the one thing that none of you cared about. What on earth is this? This is some sort of feature that will change depending on the environment properties of the system, on the system. It's not really a property of the volume, but it's also not the property of the energy. So why didn't any of you react? Because you use temperature every day. Yeah, but I didn't say that it was temperature. I just used the letter T. And then you all happily assume that it's temperature. It is, of course, temperature, right? But the point is that just because you use something every day, the reason why you're confused by entropy is that it's something you're not using every day. And then you get it. Entropy is simple. Logarithm of the microstates. This, on the other hand, is a super complicated feature. Um, we can derive what that is. So we use, start this equation, F equals E minus T. Yes, you see that it's going to come back. And then we look, you're, we can look at a small change here. Delta F, for, I like differentials because it's the mathematically proper way of doing it, but you can use delta F if you prefer. So if you look at the small change around this, and we're also going to assume that we are close to local minimum. Well, the differential here, you can use the normal derivative laws here, so that if F equals E minus TS, if I add a small change DF here, that would on the right-hand side correspond, first we have, E minus TS, that's the F, and then plus DE, and then TDS and DT multiplied by S. So just the product laws of uh, derivatives. So that, and then I can strike out F on the left hand side, and I can strike out F on the right hand side, right? So I have DF equals DE minus TDS minus SDT. That is always true. But if I now say that we are close to a local minimum in the free energy, which is some sort of, which is the equilibrium. Then by definition, the delta F should be, if I do a very small move left or right, the delta F should the first approximation be zero. And that means that delta F, which is zero, equals dE minus TDS. And again, at the equilibrium, the temperature should be constant, so dT equals zero. So that means that dE minus TDS is zero. And if you just solve there, that means that T is dE dS. You are, actually, you are allowed, I'm not sure whether you calculate it with differentials. It's one of those things that your secondary school teacher would kill you for it, but this is actually, you call the differentials, it's quite okay, you can separate them. Uh, 
So temperature is really just the derivative that how much is the energy of your system changing when the disorder increases. Do you have a gut feeling for that? Suddenly that definition of entropy was pretty easy, right? Entropy is just the logarithm of the microstates. And then somewhere here I start to get confused. What on earth is this derivative? So I'm sorry to break it to you that your entire life you thought that temperature was easy and entropy was difficult. It's the opposite. Entropy is trivial. Temperature, on the other hand, is a super complicated concept. So that's the other point. Why on earth do we have Boltzmann's constant in all these equations? So what's the units of Boltzmann's constant? Oh, you see, this is a problem, by the way. When you're, because you're so used to the equations, you haven't thought about what they mean. It's joule per Kelvin. So they somehow translate between temperature, the units of temperature, and the units of energy. If you were to, if you had been the first one, if we had come up with this today, we would likely measure temperature in somehow units of energy, and then put Boltzmann constant to one. It would have made all our equations so much simpler. But the strange thing, and this is very much a coincidence, that this concept that you're getting from some of these deep equations, and remember, Tomorrow I'm going to show that these equations are universal for any system. They don't, you don't have to assume anything about physics. So this strange derivative that we get out here corresponds perfectly one-to-one -to, -one to the concept you're used to measuring at a thermometer. Yes? How does an equilibrium in F give that T must be constant? Uh, so at equilibrium, the properties of a system are not changing. If the temperature keeps increasing, we're not at equilibrium. Because there's something on the system is changing. Why, why didn't S become constant as well in, in equilibrium? So that, well, once we, once we are at equilibrium, um, let's see, how should I justify that? Um, Let me get back to that tomorrow, and I can make, because I, we are going to be a bit short of time. It's actually a good question, because the, the, once we are at equilibrium, the entropy no longer increases. So from that point of view, you are kind of correct. Uh, but to make sure that I can finish the slides, let me think of a better way of explaining that until tomorrow. We're going to use this. The reason we're introducing this equation is that they will help us. Let's pick something complicated, <laughs> phase transitions, water, uh, ice melting into water. If we look at the ice, you can probably agree that there are lots of hydrogen bonds formed in ice that gives you a low, nice energy. Is the entropy here low? Yes, it's not just low, it's low, low, low. At zero Kelvin, this is a superordered system. In principle, there is only one way you can organize the molecules that way. Liquid water, on the other hand, the energy is high. Is it good or bad to have a high energy? All other things equal, it's bad to have high energy, so we would not form water. So something that, so that, and the entropy here, the disorder is higher, which is somehow good. So what happens when water melts? Well, we have our equation again. This equation will explain everything. At very low temperature, the T term is small, and that means that this entire term is not going to be so important. At zero Kelvin, it disappears completely, right? So at very low temperature, the energy term is by far the most important. So that we want to optimize for low energy, meaning you want to be ice. As the temperature goes up, eventually this term is going to dominate. It's much more important to make sure that that total term is low. And if this term should be small, there is a minus sign ahead of it. That means that the S should be high, right? So at very high temperature, it's much more important to be in the state that gives you high entropy. And that means that some sort of threshold is going to be better to move over into a different phase. And that explains everything about phase transitions. And that brings us to another fun concept. Um, I'm going to hand out a slide here. Uh, paper. Poly water. Have you heard of it? So this was a fun story in the 1960s that came out of Russia and Fedyakin and Deryagin. So what you know now, uh, for any type of state, phase transitions, let's just look at this as a function of temperature. We might have gas. Water vapor, we might have aqueous water, liquid, 
and one might have solid water, that is ice. Each of this has some sort of free energy. And at each of these temperature, at very high temperature, we know that the gas should be lowest and best. Then there's some sort of intermediate phase where liquid is best, and at very low temperature, the solid is best. So the lowest line here is the best one. So what happened with Fedyakin and Daryagin? In 1962, they reported that they could, under some conditions, see spontaneous water condensation in capillaries under room temperature. And their argument was that they had discovered a new phase of water called polywater that was a polymerization of water that you would pretty much have a network of hydrogen bonds. It's not quite ice, but it's polymer-like. Uh, and it would have a freezing point in the ballpark of 240 to 213 Kelvin and the boiling point just above 500 Kelvin. Uh, completely brand new phase. Based on what I just have told you, and I, this was, as you will see from this paper, that the US was so scared. They were, they were literally arguing that Russia was developing a polywater gap. Uh, and the, Bureau, the NIST Bureau of Standards and Technologies tried to repeat this and everything. There is something fundamentally wrong with this. And this is the reason you have not heard about it. And you should be able to debunk this now. Using that diagram up there, and our friend F equals E minus TS. Talk to the person to the left or right of you and see if you can come up. I'll give you one minute because we're a bit short of time. So I'll give you one last clue here that the only condition you would observe this would be some state where this water would have the lowest free energy. So that if this was true, this would mean that between the freezing point here and the boiling point, there should be another curve here where poly water should have whatever black or whatever line we would have, right? Otherwise, we would never observe it. Because if the, if the black line for poly water was higher than the liquid and the ice part here, by definition, it would never be good to be in that place, then it would be better to be normal water. So if there was, I'm not saying this, theoretically it's not impossible, that there could of course be a black curve here that's between these two points that would go from there to there. But what would that mean? Would we ever observe normal water? all the water in the world would prefer to be polywater, right? So it's impossible. Uh, and one of the person to observe this, it was Richard Feynman, of course, realized that it's completely, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the conditions you did the experiment under. It can't be true. It's impossible by definition. And this is the power because we're, you don't need to know anything about the experiment for this. If you're arguing that this is a naturally occurring phase of water that would be stable, then, all then it would be more stable than normal water. And then we would not have normal water. So that's, again, the power of this extremely simple equation. And this has actually happened in the literature, too. I'm not sure whether you've ever heard Kurt Vonnegut, Cat's Cradle. So that there is, in this book, there is a story about uh, a new form of ice. There are eight Chris, uh, uh, different types of ice form. And he, he argues that there was, well, the story of the book is basically that there is a new type of ice called Ice 9 uh, that would freeze already at 115 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly 50 degrees centigrade. And the point is that basically everything that this comes in touch with would then turn into Ice 9 and this would spread. But it's the same thing there. If this was true, all the water in the world would have turned into ice nine, right? That's because once you've turned into ice nine, you will never go back, which I think probably was kind of the point of the book. But. <laughs>
Um, let's try to do something slightly more concrete and look at hydrogen bonds. So we have two water molecules in vacuo. They are poor and don't have any hydrogen bonds. And then they find each other in water and make one hydrogen bond. Let's look at that very simple process. You will gain and you will lose some things here. You will gain the energy of one hydrogen bond. Let's call that EH. And delta EH, well, that if it's a gain here, that the, what we're gaining there, let's, let's just say that the change in energy is delta EH. And then by definition, that should be smaller than zero because it's good, right? We're gaining something. But we're also losing something. We're losing, well, we, have, we, ha we used to have two freely rotating waters. And now we're constraining one degree of freedom between them so that you kind of, we're kind of losing half the freedom for each of two waters. So let's just call that delta SH for one water. And now things get complicated because if delta S is the change of the process, it's becoming more ordered. And that means that delta SH must be negative too, right? Don't assume here. You need to think about what will it mean, the direction you're going, more ordered, less ordered, higher energy, less energy. What are the signs? It doesn't get a whole lot simpler than that. So now I'm going to do the pure challenge again. And which one of those two is true? Is the loss in energy lower than the change in entropy? Or is the change in entropy more important than the change in energy for these two? Let's do one minute again there. And I hear some of you sighing, which is perfectly fine. I too would sigh if I tried to handle it this way and guess and hand wave. So there is an equation. I wonder which one we might be able to use. Think of this equation instead. And now I put the deltas here because, again, think in terms of what has to change. We also saw in this slide, we already hand waved what the sign of that term must be. We already hand waved about what the sign of the delta SH must be. And you know that hydrogen bonds do form spontaneously in water. So that this has to be negative. Otherwise, it would not form spontaneously. So try to use that now and see if it works better. So should we go through it? Is that the delta E8, was that positive or negative? Negative, because we're definitely gaining one energy bond. So that, per se, is going to help us. The del forget about the minus sign here. Yeah. The delta SH, was that positive or negative? negative? Negative, because we're becoming more ordered. But then there is a, there's negative, and then we have a minus sign in front of it. So minus, minus is plus. So this component is positive. So that component can't be the one helping you to form the hydrogen bond. The reason the hydrogen bond forms must be because that term is more negative then that term is positive. And for waters, two waters moving to vacuum is probably, this is roughly half a kilocalorie per mole, and that's roughly five. So it's a factor of 10 difference. Do it piece by piece. Put up this equation. Don't skip the part where you have to think about the sign and the what is reasonable, and then it's much easier to think. But the, point, the equation is a help. It's not a burden. Don't try to hand wave. You can't, you can't hand wave your way through and guess these things. You need to write down the equations, think what the different terms mean, and then it becomes easy. Yes? Is all this, the thing about the change in free energy always being negative, is that because all systems tend towards? Uh, no, so remember that. The free, uh, that's a good point. The world will strive towards minimizing free energy. There is actually a study question of that on a link. You can prove that the free energy corresponds to the amount of energy available to do work. 
Uh, for now, and that would take me 10 minutes to derive, so I'm not going to do it. But any process that can happen will go in the direction where the free energy redu is reduced. So if the free energy for a process is positive, it's not going to happen spontaneously. You will go from high to low free energy. Just as if I drop something, I will go from high to low energy. So the free energy essentially describes what processes happen or not. And that's why it's so important in chemistry. If the free energy of folding a protein is negative, it's going to fold. If the free energy of folding a particular protein would be positive, it would never fold. So free energy pretty much connects physics with reality. The reason why I love to think in terms of change is because it forces you to say, what, which is the state before, which is the state after? Because again, if I were to say that, if I were to say, how much does it cost to break a hydrogen bond? Then you need to reverse everything, right? And then you need to say, what was before, what was after? And in that case, the energy would be positive and the delta S would also be positive. You can think of this inside a protein too. Because remember that I said that most amino acids will happily, many amino acids will happily form hydrogen bonds. So you can, if you do this in vacuum, this is exactly the same thing applies, that the change here corresponds roughly to the energy. But when I'm doing this for a real protein in solvent, what happens is that, well, before I folded the protein, I would be making hydrogen bonds to water. And once I have folded the protein, I will be making hydrogen bonds in the protein. But just as for the oil and water thing, those two waters will form the hydrogen bonds. So you see that the number of hydrogen bonds is really constant here. And that's the complication in reality, that the number of there are hardly any processes where the number of hydrogen bonds change. But what happens is that this is going to cause differences in entropy, while the difference in entropy, oh, sorry, in energy is virtually zero. And that's why I had to introduce entropy. Most of the folding, most of the complicated parts here is going to correspond to entropy. Same thing with the large protein. Whenever a large protein that is not folded, there are gazillion states it can be in. Once it has folded, <coughs> Amphysen's observation is one unique state, very low entropy. So this is going to be more about entropy than it. The other reason why we love free energy is that it's, we can directly connect it to experiments. So if you take, say, an uh, octanol or a hexacyclohexane, some sort, something that likes to be in oil phase, and then we check how much of this would like to be a water, the, the aqueous concentration or the solubility, it could be a salt. The way we measure this, I can just calculate how much of it is solvated versus what is the concentration when I have it in pure form. Reasonably straightforward experiments to do. But we already know that the equation, the Boltzmann distribution in particular, said that the concentration in a state or the probability of being in a state is proportional to the exponential of minus energy, or in this case, free energy, divided by kT, or if it's a chemist, RT, right? But take the logarithm of both sides of this equation, and then we can solve for delta G. So delta G is equals minus RT and then the logarithm of two different observations. So this say, what is the concentration of alcohol, uh, octanol in the aqueous phase versus the concentration in the pure alcohol phase? Both those numbers are the, relative, the difference between I can measure in the experiment. If I can measure in the experiment, I just solve for it, and then I get the delta D difference from it. And that's usually how we get delta Ds. We just measure it experimentally. And that enables us to do a couple of fun things here. Um, we can, for instance, the concentration of cyclohexane is roughly 10 moles per liter or molar. Uh, while if you put it in water, it's 1 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 4. And you can show that that corresponds to a free energy difference of roughly 7 kcals per mole. But there are many different states. You can have one molecule in gas phase, you can have many in the solvent phase, and you can have one molecule solved in water. And between all of these, you can measure what is the free energy, what is the change in energy or enthalpy. H is just E plus this um, pressure times volume term that we're not going to care about. So you can imagine that it said E there. And what is the change in entropy? All these things can either be measured in the lab or I can solve for it using that equation. Delta G equals H minus TS. Yes? Or using uh, the Gates free energy and uh, uh, 
Helmholtz free energy interchange? Yes. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, it's a, I should have a bit of bad cautious for it. This has to do with typically the equations we're applying in biophysics. The concentrations are so low that there's virtually nothing I do that will change the volume or pressure in the system. Uh, that means that I know that by definition the pressure is going to be one millionth of the other things. So mea culpa, as a physicist, I should probably have my physicist card revoked, but I don't care. Uh, so yes, we will ignore pressure throughout this course. Um, you should have a little bit of bad conscience for it, but I won't nail you for it. Um, the, but it's not entirely trivial how to get to, uh, to that, right? Just as I derived the thermodynamic temperature a few slides ago, I can actually see how the entropy changes in the system. Um, and I do that in a roughly similar fashion in the interest of time. I'm not going to go through it in detail. But if you do a bit of equations, if you measure the delta G for the same system, the same process, but do this at multiple different temperatures, just looking at this equation, to first approximation, this is going to be roughly the same, right? So that now changes. How does this change with temperature? The proportionality factor to temperature is the entropy, right? So if I just check how is this equation check changing with temperature, I can get the entropy from there. So I can get the total change in free energy, Gibbs or Helmholtz, by just measuring the concentration. I can get the entropy by changing how it varies with temperature. And then I can just solve for the energy or enthalpy. So then I can get all three components. And this actually works. Um, the book has a couple of examples for cyclohexane and everything, in particular, uh, Finkelstein. This is not at all well described in uh, the large book. And what you see here too is that whether you're putting something in a pure liquid phase full of hydrocarbon or an aqueous solution, the delta H is roughly the same. I gain lots of interactions, but the big difference is entropy. It's really bad entropy-wise to put it in water, but it's not so bad to put, in a, put it with other hydrocarbons. And the point here now is no, the point here is not just hand waving. The things that I hand waved and argue about this clat rate formation, the networks around an oil drop, that was hand waving. The reason why it's two is that we can show that it leads to the right experimental observations. There is absolutely no difference in energy. This molecule has just as much energy in this case as it had there. It's not changing the number of hydrogen bonds. If this had been a matter of breaking hundreds of hydrogen bonds, I would have seen a gigantic difference in energy. We don't. It's all entropy. And this leads to a bit of a other fun paradox that the hydrogen bond, what did I say about the hydrogen bond? What was it mainly caused by? The reason the hydrogen bond, had, it was electrostatics, right? But it's not really energy. So it's, it's an inter the hydrogen bond itself is caused by electrostatics that gives us these peculiar properties. But at the end of the day, the net effect of that is entropy, not energy. So the hydrophobic effect is an entropic effect, not an energy effect. You can see that in another way. Um, the temperature dependence. Normally, if a process depends on energy, and you, if I, let's say that it had been bad energy, that I had broken a number of hydrogen bonds. What would happen if I just added energy? With the process, if I heated it up, would I increase the solubility? Yes. Mm -hmm. But what's if it's entropy? If that term is the bad one, what happens when I increase the temperature? Does that term become less or more important? More important, right? So that the higher the temperature is, what happens with the solubility of oil and water? It gets worse. Yes, it gets worse. So it's the opposite. And you all know this when you've been cooking pasta. If you put a bit of oil in the water, it doesn't dissolve just because you boil the water, right? If anything, it becomes worse. And that's also, and that's the absurd thing that although this is an effect caused by electrostatics, the individual hydrogen bond, the hydrophobic effect is an entropic effect not an energetic effect. I've been tormenting you a bit much, uh, and, but the point of this is this is super important for proteins because proteins are going to be hydrophobic on the inside while hydrophilic on the outside. So I hate to break it to you, but we're neither going to cooking pasta or work with oil here, but proteins are fairly oily. 
So lots of the side chains of proteins are, say, tryptophan, or uh, they're basically a aromatic ring, uh, isoleucine, leucine. There are lots of amino acid side chains that are just hydrophobic. And just as if you put a benzene ring in water, in isolation, this would form a clathrate structure, this network around that. And just as for oil, what this means, if you had two of these, well, then I would need one structure around the left one and one around the right one. And what will happen is that you will minimize this area by bringing them together. Because that area, the, to the volume is the same here, but the total area around them is smaller. And that is exactly this hydrophobic effect you're seeing, that if you pour a lot of oil into water, the phases will not mix, they will separate. That's going to happen for protein too. So if we take a small protein, and I'm sorry about the coloring, of the, uh, sorry if anybody is red, green, colorblind. Uh, the red are the hydrophobic residues. This is a real protein. The green are the water-loving hydrophilic residues. So you do see how the protein instantly, and this will happen in a split second after you put it in water, all the water-loving residues are going to be on the surface, and all the water-hating residues will be buried on the inside. It's exactly the same effect as when you're solvating oil in water. Uh, we're almost out of time here, so I'm going to need to move a couple of slides to uh, tomorrow too. But what this free energy is going to be about uh, is, given a particular sequence of amino acids, will it somehow be random, or is it going to turn into some sort of maybe helix, or is it going to turn into some sort of beta sheet? Well, that will depend on the residues, right? Because depending on you have on the patterns of the residues, some of these structures are going to be more or less favorable. And in this case, blue means water loving, loving to be on the outside, and gray means water hating, love to be on the inside. Which one would you guess is most favorable? Indeed. Yes, because it can turn all the water hating ones to the inside so they don't have to face the water, while the water outside is all the water loving residues. But that's just hand waving for now. We're going to come back to that. So, and this is the last slide I'll do before I let you go. Uh, what we can summarize today with is pretty much there is some sort of this landscapes we spoke about, and we will keep using them. The energy is by far the most important part of it. We want to have low energy, but the entropy also matters. So far out here when we start, we might think of this as a large volume. There are lots of different states we can put our protein or whatever molecule we have in it. And as the energy here goes down, you will also have less and less and less and less freedom, right? That is bad. Having less freedom means that the entropy goes down and we're going to lose free energy. But there's going to be some sort of balance here that the energy must go down more than it costs me to lose the entropy. And what we're going to spend both tomorrow and a bit further down the course talking about is really this balance. Balancing energy, which is usually good when it goes down, while entropy, where it usually hurts us when we fold things. And then we're going to apply this to a bunch of different proteins and secondary structures. Uh, you should have the hand-in task for today that you can start working on. And I would actually encourage you to work on that now because it will help you understand these concepts. And in particular, it's going to help you when I go understand through things slightly more mathematically tomorrow. We have the study questions, and there should be some reading instructions both for Laurel and Finkelstein. I would strongly suggest you follow Finkelstein. He described in a far easier way than Nordland. Or I will do my utmost to make sure that I put up this recording by 6 p.m. today so that you can watch the uh, lecture a second time because it's not entirely easy to follow. Do go through it a second and third time if you need to. And with that, see you tomorrow.